Hey, this is Jared Cochran with Family Church. Welcome to our podcast. I'm excited that you're here. I hope that God moves through this message to reach you so he can move through your life. Be sure to share and subscribe so that we can reach the world with God's word. Enjoy the message. Amen, amen. Thank you. You may be, you guys can sit down. I'm ready to get to work. I'm ready. Good morning, church. How are y'all feeling this morning? Everybody, you should be feeling good because you got an extra hour of sleep. Unless you're a psychopath like me that, you know, your body's used to waking up. So uh, you still just wake up. And then you try to go back to sleep, even though the alarm's about to go off. That's pointless. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I got here. I'll tell you, it's, it's a good day to be in, in the house of the Lord. I want to start with that. I want to start with that. Uh, I got here about 4.50 just to start praying, and God's presence is here today. And, man... <laughs> It's, it, the hardest thing is to go from, from all of that and just saturating in his presence and then coming into this. Um, I don't take that lightly. But uh, if this is your first time here, if you're visiting with us, welcome to Family Church. I'm glad you're here. My name is Jared. Uh, if you are a non-believer or an atheist, you do belong before you believe. You don't have to believe in Jesus to come here. Uh, I invite you to keep coming here. A lot of people, I guess, are nervous when I say something like that. But uh, no, I invite you to keep coming here and listening to us just have these conversations from God's word through his truth. We're just, uh, we're not into the, the entertainment value and the semantics. We just, we're just hungry. We're just hungry here. And our hunger is getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And we're diving in. Uh, most of us <laughs> are diving in. Um, I, I'm, I'm a little heavy this morning. If you haven't been here or you haven't been here in a while, we're in a series in Jude called Contend. This is uh, episode four. And for the note takers, we'll be in just verses 11 through 13 today. Jude is only one uh, chapter long. It's one book. It's really a letter. It's only 25 verses. It's easy to read. And if you've been with us, we know that Jude calls himself and is a servant of Jesus Christ, but he is a brother of James, James being one of the brothers of Jesus Christ, just thus. Jude also being a brother of Jesus Christ, but he considers it more, uh, how do I put this, more humble, more honorable to be a servant than to be known as the brother of Jesus Jude and James never used their status as being uh, the brother of Jesus uh, to gain any type of advantage. Um, they, were, they had enough humility that they tried to distance themselves from that and just follow him as his disciple, as his servant. Uh, we know from Matthew and the other gospels that at first they did not believe him. The word says that they thought he was out of his mind. And then when he was killed and resurrected from the grave to defeat death, hell, and the grave, and to defeat sin. Then they realized that he was who he said he was, the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, the, the, ooh, the living son of God that came down. I'm, I cannot temper the, mm, the fire that is within me. So I do want to preface this with something up front, because I already know, and this is dumb, but I'm going to do it anyways. Um, we started this... Uh, probably, what, five weeks ago because we're in week four, but I did miss a week because we were on vacation. I did not plan these ahead. We're just taking our time and going through them. I actually, they've been adjusted as God has walked me through these passages. And so today's message is a heavy one, but it is incredibly relevant, especially for <laughs> this church at this time. Um, if you've done your homework, you're going to know where this is going, but I want to stand up here publicly out front before the rumors start and before the emails start and the comments start that I did not pick this passage, God picked this passage, and it ended up to be here at this point in time for a reason. It, it, is, it is phenomenal. 
Uh, I am I'm excited, but I'm also like, man, I know what's going to come from this and the, the comments, but it's a good thing. Uh, let me give you the best introduction to Family Church, and if you don't like me, you can figure it out right from this next sentence. I'm glad that I don't give a crap what man thinks about me because I'm more worried about what Jesus thinks. So if that statement offends you, there's going to be more, I'm sure. That's good. That's how conviction works. If that makes you upset, in a moment, I will pray. You can go out the doors. You can go down to Colonial Church. You can go down to Reverb Church. I don't care where you go as long as they're a biblical church. Don't go somewhere. Uh, There's a Methodist church downtown that has a gay youth pastor. Don't go there. I'm not afraid to call it out. We're going to call out sin for being sin. Uh, Also, in a moment of... um, Transparency and humility. I did say something last week um, about, and it's in this passage about the second death, and I incorrectly incorrectly referred to it, and I said it wasn't pointing to the second death in Revelation. That was just a fog of the mind. Uh, but I do want to put that out that I do make mistakes, and none of y'all caught it, so you're not testing me like I always say to do. I'm just kidding. All right, let's 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 pray first and foremost, Heavenly Father. Posture our hearts towards you. God, we have invited your presence. We've invited your spirit into this very room to saturate us in your glory, in your your presence, God. We ask, God, that you permeate every inch of this very property, Lord. That no weapon formed against it, no weapon formed against this ministry will prosper, Lord. And I ask you, God, stir up your saints, create in us a love for your word, a love for the scriptures, create in us a passion. So we're not just watching (laughs) me go through uh, severe animations, but that we begin to apply it. That we don't just listen to these words, but that we soak in it, that we feed on it throughout the rest of the weeks. And that we focus our hearts on you, God. We pray, Lord, sin revival. Sin revival. Sin revival, God. Sin revival to St. Augustine. Start here and make this place the hot spot of holiness, Lord. And Father, while we are there, I pray sin revival to America. I pray for the election that the one who is going to declare Jesus is Lord, who is going to know that no man is put into authority apart from what God has ordained that keeps Jesus Christ at the center. I pray, God, that America is stirred back up for you. And Lord, that no matter what happens, it is not politics that are in power. It is the Holy Spirit. It is God the Father. It is Jesus Christ, the Son, who sits on the only throne and controls mm, everything. And in the mighty and in the majestic, I feel it, and in the matchless name of God. Fire, Lord. Amen. Amen. Oh, we are in it for today. We are in it for today. Jude. I don't say chapter one because there's only one chapter. Uh, Again, we're going to be in verses 11 through 13. If you haven't come here, I know that sounds like two verses and we'll be out of here in 20 minutes. Well, I have news for you. (laughs) Wrong. Start, oh Lord, starting in verse 11. Can I start my clock so I don't go too far over time? Thank you. No, that's for revival. If y'all missed revival night, I'm ready for the next one. We went three, yes. Hallelujah. FOMO for sure. If you missed it, you missed out. Uh, We went, what was it, like three hours, three and a half hours? We went everywhere, man. We went everywhere because... No limits, and and God moved, and it was an absolutely glorious time. Verse 11, woe, (laughs) woe to them. Who is them? Well, we know from the previous weeks, let me pick this bad boy up. We know from the previous weeks that Jude used, remember I told you at the beginning, there's triads in here. There's themes of three. So you're called, you're beloved, and you're kept in Jesus Christ, kept for Jesus Christ, and may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. 
And then he says that he wanted to write about our common salvation, something that would make us happy, something that would make us feel good, because that's all something we enjoy. We like our salvation. We love it. But then he found out that it was more necessary to urge us to contend for the faith. That's the name of the series that I neglected to mention is contend. We are trying to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And then he goes in and he doesn't immediately tell us how to contend for the faith. Instead, he reminds us of things that happened before. And so with his first uh, three examples, he used groups of people. He talked about the people that came out of the land of Egypt and afterward were destroyed because they did not believe God at his word. He talked about the groups of angels, which is a third of the angels that uh, rebelled against God and neglected God and was banished from heaven. So that's the other group. And they're kept in eternal chains. And then he talked about Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities in order to point us to what happens when we engage in these things. And you have to pay attention to If you're not paying attention now, make sure you pay attention now. But uh, you have to pay attention to the positioning of where these are in the passage, especially today. Especially today. So then he talks about the false prophets, which is the danger that he is warning people of. And he says that in like manner, they also rely on their dreams. They defile the flesh. They reject authority. They blaspheme the glorious ones. They blaspheme all they do not understand. And they are destroyed They blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed like unreasoning animals. uh, I'm sorry. Destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. So something that came to me uh, this morning as I was reading this again, just going over my notes and everything, is that they are destroyed by what they understand instinctively. We all have God within our DNA. We all know there is a God. We all know that he exists. We know inherently within us, instinctively within us, that we come from a creator. There was no big bang. You don't take nothing and then nothing just turns into something. Something has to exist. Someone had to exist. There was no universe. You don't pray to the universe. You pray to God. The demonic tries to twist you and get you to do anything else under the sun other than to just focus on God, or the demonic wants you to focus on God and something else, which is a lot of where American Christianity has fallen astray because we think we can have Jesus and something else. That's not to say you can't be blessed and have nice things. You can't be blessed and have a good life and have a good business and have a nice house and have a nice car. God's not saying anything of that. What he is saying is that when you try to put Jesus on the same level as something else, or for most of us, what we end up doing is putting it severely above Jesus because we go to jobs and careers that we hate and we work 97 hours a week and we put about three minutes in of our Bible study. If that, unless we just come to church on Sunday and this is all we get. So we have idolized so many things in Western American cotton candy Christianity, and we call it good, and all it's doing is rotting our soul out. Verse 11. Woe to them. Stop. Woe to them. If you don't know what woe means, and no, it's not uh, woe as in a horse. This is W-O-E. You can leave it up for a minute. This is a word and a phrase that was uh, frequent with Jesus, but rare elsewhere in the New Testament. And in Matthew 23, Jesus pronounced seven woes against the Pharisees. This is him expressing grief and anguish over their condition while simultaneously pronouncing judgment on them. Because their hearts are so hardened, even though they are the religious elite, their hearts are so hardened by what they think they can do. They thought they could follow the rules instead of following God and thus become their own savior, which is why they rejected Jesus when he came because they thought if I do X, Y, Z, one, two, three, and say, God, you know, now I lay me down to sleep, pray the Lord my soul to keep. As long as we keep the rules, God will save us. That doesn't work. It's not by your works, so no man can boast. Ah, but by Jesus Christ alone. And then it's not really anywhere else in the New Testament, but there is three woes in Revelation. But the first woe that Jesus pronounced in Matthew 23 against the Pharisees was he said, (coughs) excuse me, he said, did I I bookmark it? Because I want to read it. Nope, I 
didn't. Said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You close the door for them. You can take the scripture down. Thank you. Um, For you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves, they're not getting into heaven, or nor allow those who would enter to go in. So because they are in charge of teaching people, they are instead misleading people because they reject Jesus and they end up rejecting heaven. And since this is what they believe and this is what they teach, they end up hindering other people from even experiencing Jesus and experiencing the belief and they block the way for other people to come to God. That's the danger of the false prophets, people that you think are leading you in the right way, but they're leading you astray. And the second woe that he goes on to say is he he sends a woe at them because they're teaching their converts in the same way, so they become like carbon little clones of what they are. So since they do the right thing, they teach these people, and it leads them to a religion of works, which is not true righteousness. And he says it makes them, you make him, you make them, People, it's not just him, like it's only men, ladies. You make them, you make him twice as much as a child of hell as you are. Talking to the Pharisees. Y'all think I'm rough, Jesus was rough. So they have led people astray. They have brainwashed them with bad teaching and thus the cycle continues. And they create more. But these people don't know. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain. They, uh, Cain. Cain is the firstborn human. Adam was created, Eve is created from the rib of Adam, and then after they sin in the garden, introduce sin, they go out. Cain is the firstborn, and then his brother is Abel. Now, the way of Cain, if you want to take notes, is discovery, despair, And departure. So discovery. Abel was a shepherd. He's the younger brother. He is a shepherd. Cain is a farmer. He works with the ground. And the Bible says that Cain brought an offering. That's all it says. He brought an offering. But when it mentions Abel, it says that he brought the firstborn of the flock and the fat portions. This is him bringing something of severe and important value. This is him offering his best. The reason that God did not accept Cain's offering is because it was not from the heart. And actually, in Genesis 3, chapter, uh, I'm sorry, Genesis 3, verse 17, God says, because of their sin, cursed is the ground because of you. So Cain's, and since he's a farmer, Cain's offering is already rooted in something that is cursed. His offering is already rooted in sin because he doesn't understand exactly what it is and and the need for a, how do I put this, for a blood sacrifice. So when Adam and Eve were in the garden and they introduced and, and they were deceived into sin, the serpent deceives them into sin and then they are aware of their nakedness. They're aware of their sin. And then God himself sacrifices the first animal in human history. And he clothes them with it. He clothes them with it. Because our whole belief is, is, is based in blood. The wages of sin is death. So something has to die to pay for your sins. So God, when they first sin in his loving grace, institutes the first sacrifice, maybe a lamb. I don't know. I don't want to read that into the text, but Jesus was the lamb that was slain. So he first clothes Adam and Eve in the, in the garments of an animal in, in the first sacrifice of humanity, and then later introduces his son, the lamb that was slain before the the creation of earth before the foundation of earth and instead of you having to do something God created ooh God sent Jesus and made the last and only sacrifice that ever had to be in history anymore I don't know why y'all don't get excited about that because if it wasn't for that you'd still be living in brokenness you'd still be living in shame you'd still be living in sin you'd still be living in addiction your bondage would still be holding you your darkness would still be holding you your sin would be ripping your soul apart if it were not for the seal of the Holy Spirit because of God sending his son and dying for your sins. 
So Cain ignores the very fact that our entire belief in this thing called Christianity from Jesus, the entire thing is based in blood. So he's angry because God doesn't accept his sacrifice. He takes Abel's because Abel realizes this. He looks back and he remembers, oh, there was an animal that was slain to clothe my parents. So maybe that's the kind of sacrifice that we need. Or maybe Adam and Eve even told them, we don't know. We don't have that written down. But either way you look at it, Cain decided that he was going to ignore that. And he gets angry. And God warns him of his anger. He says, sin is crouching at your door. And sin is crouching at your door, and whatever your next decision is will decide your fate. You will either repent and come to me the way that you should come to me, or you will reject it and do what I, God, not me, God, already knows what you're about to do. And if you know the story of Cain and Abel, he kills, Cain kills Abel out of jealousy and anger. And immediately he hears from God. Immediately. What is this? That's called conviction. That's why when you sin and you immediately feel bad, that's the Holy Spirit giving you conviction. If you sin and you feel nothing, that's when you're in a bad place. When you sit in church and you feel nothing, that's when you're in a bad place. When you sit under teaching and through worship and you feel nothing and you're not stirred up, and it's not about just stirring up your emotions, but when you feel nothing from the Holy Spirit moving you and pulling you, you are in a dangerous place. You are hardening your heart against the Holy Spirit, and that is the unpardonable sin. The point is... God cleans you up after you come to him. Over time, sanctification is the lifelong process. I know a lot of churches want you to believe as soon as you say, hey, Jesus is Lord and my Savior, boom, you should be cleaned up, be coming in a suit and tie, go get all your tattoos removed or whatever it is that they disagree with. If you're a girl, don't wear a dress, go wear pants. And we put all these man-made traditions on it instead of just realizing it is all about Jesus and Jesus making that heart change, not man. The way of discovery. So Cain kills him. And you can imagine, this is, this is the first death. Adam and Eve are still alive. They have more babies after this. But at this point, this is the first death. This is the first murder. Apart from sin being introduced, this is our written record of what is the first sin in humanity after Adam and Eve. So I I look at this and I see Cain just standing over the dead body of his brother that he did with his bare hands. Now, if you want to talk about hardening your heart, yeah, murder is going to harden your heart. It's probably going to be hard the first time, but the next time it's going to get a little bit easier. That's what happens with serial killers. And it gets easier and easier and then they're completely disconnected. But when you kill your own bloodline and you kill your own brother, your own flesh and blood, that's gonna harden you in a faster and a stronger and a deeper way. So he's staring at the dead body of his brother, and then this leads to discovery of more sin. Because God asks him, where is your brother? And he comes up with the first lie. I don't know, am I my brother's keeper? Throwing the sass at God. Y'all act like we don't. Why are you typing in that website at 3 o'clock in the morning? Oh, I don't know. Why are you going to meet the, your plug? Why are you your drug dealer for you old people? Why are you going to meet the person that's going to sell you illum- uh, illegal pharmaceuticals and other uh, things that lead you down dark paths? Does that work better? Perfect, we're on the same page. Why are you going back to that bar? Why are you going back to that group of friends? You feel that conviction from God. But when you choose to reject it, you harden yourself against the Holy Spirit. And that's where you're putting yourself in danger every time. And, and all of us, myself included, I'll start with me. There's something within this book that strikes you to your core that you try to harden your heart against. And that is the point of when I come up and I pray, Lord, crush me, Lord, break me, because I don't want the discipline, I want the benefits from the discipline. That's where you need to be. You've got to be disciplined in order to be an effective disciple. 
And if you're tired of me bringing up Matthew 28, 19, guess what? You're supposed to be a disciple doing what? (laughs) What the heck was that? Making more disciples. This is a dialogue, people. Let's enjoy the conversation together. Don't come here just to hear me speak. Y'all talk back to me. That's a little much. Dial it down. (laughs) So he, he murders someone. And then he discovers, I'm moving so slow, whatever. He discovers another way of sin. He lies about it. And he is warned of the consequences of sin. I warn you of the consequences of sin. Preachers warn you of the consequences of sin. Jesus warns and warned you of the consequences of sin. But we choose to reject that. We choose to believe, like Cain, that there is no judgment, there is no judge, there's no reward coming for righteous living, and thus there's no destruction for the wicked. This leads to Cain's despair, where he is banished out and forced to wander the earth, and he's afraid that people will kill him, and God puts it on him that if anyone kills him, he will be avenged sevenfold. Yes, that's where the band got their name from. That leads to his despair. And he says, my punishment is more than I can bear. And lastly, the departure, where he leaves God because he's banished. And then he goes out and he builds a city (laughs) where he immediately tries to drown out his pain with pleasure. The way of Cain is the way of the world where we know there's a God, we hear about God, we hear about sin, it's in our DNA, we inherently know, I don't care how much you wanna think you're good, you know the Bible says, clear as day, none are good, no, not one, except for Jesus Christ, the only person who ever lived that was perfect, so none of us are good, we hear about that, we hear about God, we hear about sin, we hear about the need for repentance, we hear about that, but instead what we do is we try to drown God out with every kind of pleasure imaginable. We go seeking drugs. We go seeking women. We go seeking men. We get on Tinder. I don't know the other ones. We go to bars. We go to clubs. And we try to drown God out with pleasure, never realizing we're making the void even bigger within us. That's why you reach that place of brokenness because you're trying to fill a hole that's really only getting bigger. The Bible says... Thank you, Holy Spirit. The Bible says when someone gets cleaned up, like we were talking about, Jason, when someone gets cleaned up, if the Holy Spirit does not come in you and does not seal you, seven more spirits will come in and the situation will be worse than the first. That's why somebody can come in this very building right now and today be delivered from their demons, but not delivered from their situation. So they will go back into the world and they'll tell their friends, hey, I had a great time at church. I got delivered. I don't really want to do drugs anymore. But then immediately after a few weeks, I don't want to say immediately, maybe a couple days, maybe a couple months, they'll reconnect with someone in their past and fall back into the same situation. Worse than before. That's why when they got on the boat, And the big storm came, and Jesus had to calm the storm. And immediately when they reached the other side, Jesus was there. Hmm, Y'all think he didn't know this, that he was on an assignment. He knew. He knew his timetable. He knew exactly what was on the other side of that storm. And what was on the other side of that storm they had, that he had to rebuke was a man whose name was Legion. Legion being 6,000 soldiers. Legion being over 6,000 demons within this man's body ravaging him. And Jesus delivers that man. But the storm came right before the deliverance in order to try to stop them. Amen. Continuing. We walk, they walked. I'll give you a hint now. Pay attention to the words, the nouns, the verbs, and the positioning of these if you know your Bible. If not, you're about to have your mind blown. At some point today, they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error. Now, Balaam, 
That was Genesis 3 for Cain. Balaam is in Numbers 22 through 24. And the story of Balaam is that the king of Moab, Balak, and this is so confusing. I have switched these names up so so many times studying this week. Balak, the king of Moab, sees the Israelites destroying and conquering these other nations. And then he gets scared and he sends uh, elders with money and gifts to go find Balaam, who was a prophet. And what's sad, before we dive into this section of the story, what's sad about this is Balaam is a Gentile prophet. He's not an Israelite. He was a Gentile, and he was gifted with being a prophet. He could hear from God. God spoke to him, but the story is so tragic. So they send uh, the elders to him to bribe him and tell him, hey, you go. The Israelites are too good. Go, come to me, uh, curse the Israelites. And he says, let me go talk to God, but I can only say, (laughs) God's calling somebody to wake up. He says, I can only say what God tells me to say. God tells him, no, you cannot, cur- <laughs> you cannot curse them. They are blessed. They are my people. So he goes back, tells them that. They don't like that answer. So they try again. It says they send princes this time, more in number, more in honor. They upped the stakes of the game. They made the bribe more enticing. So they go back. Same thing happens. And what ends up happening is he, God tells him to go but to only do, to only say what he says to do. And if you know the story of how God can use anyone, and I won't use the King James language, uh, Balaam is riding a donkey and Jesus appears before the donkey. You know, <laughs> yeah. Jesus appears before the donkey. The donkey sees him, turns away. Balaam freaks out, beats the donkey. Happens again. Balaam freaks out, beats the donkey. Then it goes, Jesus, me, oh man, Jesus meets them on a path that is so tight, so, mm, thank you, Jesus, so narrow. There's no way to get through. Oh my God. There's no way to get through that path other than what, mm, Then walking through Jesus, you have to go through him to get through the narrow path. He is the door. Yes, he is the gate. Woo! And you can't get past him. So the donkey lays down. Mm, You can't get through into anywhere you need to go without Jesus. Narrow is the gate. You are not getting mm, into heaven without getting through Jesus. So the donkey lays down (laughs) and he beats the donkey again. And God can use anyone. He'll speak through a you know what. King James people. I'll be good. He speaks through the donkey, and the donkey asks him, what's going on? Why you beat me like this? I've never treated you that way. God can speak through anyone, anything that he chooses. When he came to Moses, he was fire in a bush. So then he ends up going to three different locations with Balak and offering 14 sacrifices at each location. And every single time, God speaks through him to pronounce a blessing every single time. Because you you cannot curse. You cannot curse what God has blessed. You cannot cancel what God has called. If he said he's going to do it, it doesn't matter what you say against it. You think death and life are in the power of the tongue, and it is. But if Jesus, if God says, I'm going to do this thing through this person for this reason, this is who I picked, this is who I anointed, guess what? You don't get a say in it. You just got to go along for the ride. And then he even, oh my Lord, he even prophesies Jesus coming. And then he goes home. So we think, oh man, it's all good, right? No. (laughs) The very next chapter, the very first verse of chapter 25, it says, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. They were immediately led astray when he went back home. They began to worship the false gods. They began to worship false idols. And Jude has told us about people that obtain, false prophets that obtain leadership. And the key to this is that they abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error. The sake of gain. Balaam took the bribe. 
He hardened his heart so badly, so differently that when he went home, since he couldn't curse the men of Israel, but he was so enticed by the bribe that he found a way around it to circumnavigate God's plan and to try to stop uh, God's plan essentially because he could not physically curse them since God said you could not. So what he does is he goes to the enemy and tells the enemy, hey, start doing this. Get your women to sleep with them and lead them astray. Treason. Treason. He could not curse, only bless. So the greed, as Numbers 31, 16, the greed led him to rejecting God's commands for the sake of gain. Now, Jude shows us all throughout this book that the wolves sneak in. And he's saying here of the danger of greed and how like Cain and Balaam, they hear God's warnings, they know God's warnings, but they decide they disagree. They decide their way is better. We decide our way is better. Surely God didn't mean what he said when he said it. (laughs) Surely God didn't mean love your neighbor and he meant love everybody, not just the person that that lives right beside your house. When Jesus, when Peter tries to get around forgiveness and ask Jesus by saying, hey, uh, do I forgive people seven times? Because in that day, the Pharisees were teaching that you only had to give, forgive three times. And if somebody messed up after the three times, you, were, you didn't have to worry about forgiving them. You were, you, were, you were clean. So Peter tries to impress Jesus and chooses the number of perfection that says, how many times should I forgive them? Lord, seven. And Jesus says, no, 70. Or 70 times 70. What is he saying? 70 times 70, 490. Have you kept track of how many times somebody hurt your feelings? Have you kept track of how many times, somebody might, that I have offended you? He says this number, well, then y'all come up to the altar and repent, baby, because Jesus is telling you, you ain't supposed to be keeping track of it. That's why the number's so high, because you're just supposed to keep forgiving them no matter what they did, turn the other cheek and keep forgiving them. So these people, they slip in like Cain. They harden their heart. They want the greed. They want, they want the gain like Balaam. Their way is better. So they're going to start a group. And they're going to go out and they're going to start another church to cause chaos. And this leads us to the final one. Where is it? The sake of uh, gain uh, to Balaam's heir and perished in Korah's Rebellion. They walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. This is Numbers uh, 16. So Cain is Genesis 3. Balaam is uh, Numbers 22 to 24. And Korah is Numbers 16. If we were doing this chronologically, Korah should be second. So it's third for a purpose. This is why I tell you, pay attention to the way the Bible is written. It is written by man, but inspired by the Holy Spirit. Written over 1,500 years with a number of authors, all pointing towards Jesus. One theme, one God, all agreeing with itself. There are no, 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 no contradictions. I don't care what TikTok says. I don't care what your girlfriend says. I don't care what your boyfriend says. I don't care what people say. There's not one single contradiction within the word of God. If you think there is, you're reading it wrong. You're not reading context. You're pulling without. You're pulling it out of thing in order to illustrate like we learned last week instead of for instruction. God's word is perfect. Perfect. It is living. It is active. That's why this speaks to us now the same way it spoke to them. So this should have been second. And Jude has used increasingly strong nouns, the way, the error, and the rebellion And increasingly strong verbs, walked and abandoned and perished. In the NIV, it is destroyed. He is 
pointing you towards something. He is showing that the progression of sin is leading towards Korah. He's showing you this is the climax. As bad as those things were, this is the one that is the biggest problem. This is the one that is showing you what happens if you follow down these train of sin. You walk in it, and then you abandon yourself to it, and now you're in full-scale rebellion, a full-scale revolt, if you know the story of Korah, that ends in judgment. So Korah, Korah and some priests, the Bible says they became insolent, which is rude and arrogant. And they get 250 people to revolt against Moses. Two hundred and fifty people to revolt against Moses. Oh, help me, Lord. They decided <laughs> I didn't pick this, this is God. They decided they didn't like who God picked to be in charge. They decided they don't like the leadership change. They don't like the leadership that has been established. And they kick back against it. They get 250 people to lead a revolt. And they say, I don't think you should be in charge. It should be me. Why do you get to go out in front of everyone else? Why do you get to be put on a platform? Why do you get to go above all of these other people? Why did God choose you? And so what they do is they try to grab, they try to grab their censor and climb the ladder to success. But when Jesus came to earth, he grabbed a towel and he descended down to wash people's feet and to clean you from your sin. He did not have to climb up even though he was God and is equal with God. He came to serve, not to be served. The last will be first. And the first will be last. The greatest in the kingdom are the least of these. The people not concerned about position and title and authority. The people who just want to serve God. And take him at his word. And follow him at his word. And live out his word. And go forth and make disciples. So Korah comes up. 250 people. (laughs) Y'all should go read this thing today. I wish I had time. He comes up, and they're like, we're not doing this. We should be in charge. And Moses is grieved. This literally happened a few chapters ago, actually. Thank you, God. With Miriam and Aaron. They came up and did the same thing, just the two of them. Now, notice, for a further point, this is the husband and the wife. They come up to Moses, do the same thing. Why are you in charge? Why, why are we not equal? Why are we not above you? Why did God pick you? We're always, why, 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 why? Jealousy, resentment, the big one, insecurity. What's insecurity start with? I. I. Yeah, you remember that one, pride? I being in the middle of pride. So what ends up happening is they gather everyone together. God says, get away from their tent. Ah, oh, this, so, this is so gangster of Moses. Let me, hold on. It's so good. It's so good. Let me find it. Hold up. Two seconds. Uh, help me, Holy Spirit. All right, here we go. The Lord spoke to, this is uh, Numbers 16, 20. The Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron saying, separate yourself, yourselves from among the congregation that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell on their faces and said, oh God, the, the God of the spirits and all flesh shall, shall one man sin and you be angry with all the congregation. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, say to the congregation, get away from the dwelling of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Don't associate with these people. Remove yourself from their presence. Then Moses rose, went to Dathan and Abiram, 
He told them to depart, so they got away from it. And Dathan and Abiram came and stood at the door of their tents together with their wives. This is depressing. Their sons and their little ones. And Moses said, hereby you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works and that it has not been of my own accord. Moses spent more than one chapter arguing with God on why he should not be chosen. He is known as the reluctant prophet. He did not want the calling. I did not want this. I was very happy in line work, making a lot more money. And when someone was being annoying, I could yell at them (laughs) and get them into line to do what they needed to do. Because somehow within our jobs and our careers, and this is going to be my soapbox for a little second, somehow when it comes to our man-made desires, jobs, and careers, we like the hierarchy. You come in, you're a new hire. You got to answer to your supervisor. You got to answer to your manager. But like Cora, when it comes to the Bible, when it comes to church, we decide, nope, God couldn't have chose you. Uh, come on. Yes, sir. And we rebel against it. And what happens? Moses says, hereby you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works and that has not been on my own accord. If these men die as all men die, naturally, or if they are visited by the fate of all mankind, then the Lord has not sent me. But, whoo, this is a big old but. But, if the Lord creates something new and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them up, with all that belongs to them, and they go down alive into Sheol, then you shall know that these men, pay attention, have despised the Lord. Notice he did not say, they're going to die because they despised me. Because Moses was the one God chose. So when they rebelled against Moses, they rebelled against God himself. Next verse. And as soon <laughs> as, as soon as he had finished speaking, speaking these words, the ground under them split apart and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all the people who belonged to Korah and their goods. So they and all that belonged to them went down alive. Their sin caused them to be swallowed whole. And everything they owned and everyone with them in their household. Your sin, men, pay attention. Your sin, men, pay attention. Your sin does not just affect you. You are the God-ordained leader of your household. Take the charge and start doing what God has called you to do. When you lead lead a sinful life, you are leading your entire family into destruction. Now, I don't know about you. I love my wife as much as she uh, gets on my nerves sometimes. I don't know if she's watching because she had to run home. I love you. I get on her nerves way more than she gets on mine. That's why I'm saying that. I love my kids as much as they get on my nerves. Now, I don't know about you. I'm not going to live a life that is going to lead my family into hell. As much as I say your blood is not going to be on my hands, I'm going to make dang sure that theirs first is not on my hands. Because the last thing I'm going to do is be like, oh, holy Jesus, thank God I'm in heaven and I'm in the right line and look over and there's the beings 
that I created from my body and my wife's body looking at me wondering, why didn't you tell us? Why didn't you warn us? Why are we banished to eternal damnation? Because you refuse to step up and do what God has called you to do. Whole families caused by this. Now, what I was saying with Moses and Miriam, no, Aaron and Miriam, I know I got that wrong. Aaron and Miriam, there we go. The husband and the wife. This is Korah and all these people and all their families and all their children. This doesn't just happen. Rebellion doesn't just spring up and we're like, whoa, where did that come from? This takes time to brew. It starts with insecurity. It starts with jealousy. It starts with resentment. I'll wager it starts first with conviction that you're hardening your heart against. And then that breeds off into the other emotions. Anger and resentment and bitterness and jealousy, strife, division. This makes you have conversations within your home. Because first, what you're going to do when you want to rebel, which you might not want to at first, but this is how it starts. You first start going to your safe space at your house where nobody can hear what you're talking about. And you will begin to discuss with your wife, I don't like how this is going. I don't like how this looks. I don't like the direction this is going in. And then what you do, because she, (laughs) like Eve, is not saying, you're being stupid and you need to repent. Hopefully that's what she does. If not, girls, get it together. So then what happens is they make an echo chamber within their home. And the bitterness and the jealousy and the rage, it just festers. And then what they do? They come, what do they do? Great English. They come back into the buildings. They come back into the church. They come back into their job. And they find people that they can grumble with and complain with and say just one little undermined comment in order to feed off of that and decide, hey, is this person going to be able to, can I, can I, mm, can I steer this person into my corner? Are they as mad as this, at this person as I am? Nope, they're not. Okay, I'm going to go over here and we're going to try it just a little bit. Hey, I don't like how this looks. What do you think about this new guy? Oh, man, he's kind of a jerk. Yeah, let's go find some more people. And then they keep discussing, and that is how this rebellion becomes because it it creates an echo chamber. And they're only hearing themselves, and they don't know how to repent because no one within their circle is telling them that they're wrong, that they're leading a sinful life. (laughs) God uses who he chooses. What's another way of saying this? God is not going to let a rival stop a revival. (laughs) If he puts someone in place. Yeah, that was good when he gave it to me. God is not going to let a rival stop a revival. I highlighted that sucker in red. I'm like, oh. If he put someone in place, he put Moses in place, that's for a reason. You are not sovereign. You are not omnipotent. (laughs) I'll be nice. Remember now, we are called sheep by Jesus. You remember what we found out about sheep? They're not smart animals. They're dumb, they're prone to fighting and bickering and biting at each other, and they're prone to wandering off. We're all sheep. I'm sheep. I'm not calling you stupid. That was what Jesus did. And he called me stupid too. We don't know. We try to follow, we laugh at it, but we try to follow our own way. We're just not smart. I don't care what your IQ is. We're just not smart. That's There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. We can be a little bit smarter than others, but God knows everything. He decides. He's outside of time, and he decides, this person is here for this purpose. They're going to accomplish what I want to do in this season for this people, and that is why they are there. 
And any weapon formed against them shall not prosper. It will form. It will look like a threat. It will look like it's going to break the church apart. It's going to look like it's going to break their family apart. But the weapon will be formed, but it will not prosper. It will not be able to work against you. It will not be able to fight against you. It will look like it can stand up against you. And if you cower against it and you get your, you start peeing down your leg because you're too scared to stand up and realize the authority that God has put within you, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, death and life are in the power of the tongue, you've got the living, mm, 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 the Holy Spirit is within you, and you have got to realize it and unlock that, realize the kingdom that you belong to, you are soldiers for Christ, not sleepers, these people They poisonously infiltrate where they go. And they fester and they breed more and they get there under your nose. You do not see them. Wolves in sheep's clothing. You don't recognize them. They look like you. They look like me. That's why I say test me. That's why I stood up here and told you I said something wrong last week. Even though it was an accident, I'll still admit it. So they get put under our noses. That's why you have to watch for fruit. Now, I don't know about you, and I don't know a whole lot about plants, but you don't plant a tree, you don't plant uh, an apple tree or a grapevine or an orange bush or whatever, and then the fruit immediately starts coming out. That takes time. It takes time to see the fruit of people. So you cannot just immediately accept everything they say. You need to watch them, watch for their fruit, and see if they are who they say they are. And if you think this isn't something real, you think this is all just a bunch of hocus pocus, there would be no letter. There would be no letter. Jude would not have warned against these. Jesus would not have warned against these. And if there were no false prophets, Jesus is essentially a liar. And he's not. So if you are upset at who God calls and who God chooses and you think you could do a better job, you need to come to the altar. You need to lay that sin down. You need to repent of that sin down because if he wanted you to do it, he would have called you. He would have chosen you. But you realize (laughs) the reason you're angry uh, of not having... Just this position or the position in your job and the reason that you don't realize your purpose and you're mad at your job and you're mad at your career is because God already, before you were formed in the womb, he already knew what he had for you. He already knew the purpose he had for you. And you have to discover that. You have to find that. You find that by seeking God first. And as you walk with Jesus and you walk it out, you will then discover what you are supposed to really do. You weren't put here just for a nine to five. You were put here for a purpose that God designed. So you have to repent. You have to look at the fruit. You have to realize God picks specific people. Another case, Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. He prophesies in Malachi 3, a messenger that will prepare the way. And the Lord says that he will send Elijah. And then the Lord, uh, and then the Lord whom they seek will suddenly come. So someone comes first. He'll look like Elijah. Then the Lord that you seek, your deliverer, will suddenly come. Who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? He is like a refiner's fire. (laughs) I'm running out of time. We need to quit giving more credit to the devil for the fires and the trials that come against us and instead need to realize that sometimes it's God putting you through a crucible in order to bring the impurities to the surface in order that you will be made more whole, made more righteous, made more holy in order to be in accordance with his will. So when you've got everything coming against you, quit saying it's all the devil. Sometimes it's God. God is all good, but not everything good is God. 
So he prophesies this, and then there's 400 years of silence. Silence for 400 years. There's no prophets. There's no written record of God's engagement with humanity. Silence. Now, obviously, God is still there working behind the scenes. But at this point in time, after the 400 years, the Jews are exhausted. They're tired. They've been exiled from their land. They've had their cities destroyed. They've had their lives torn apart. They've lived as slaves. They've rebuilt their cities. And now they live in their homeland (laughs) under a very oppressive government. Y'all ain't catching that. They're living in their homeland under one of the cruelest, darkest governments in history. They've been put through the ringer for 400 years, and they're living under one of the most oppressive governments in history. And then a man appears on the scene wearing camel's hair. He descended from priests, but he chose to reject tradition. He chose to reject the comforts of man. And instead of his priestly garments that he should have worn, instead of the button-up shirt and the suit and tie that he should have worn, he comes wearing camel's hair. Now, anybody paying attention and anybody that knew the word at this time would realize that by him wearing camel's hair, God is showing them, this is Elijah. Come again. This is the messenger that I prophesied to you 400 years ago. Elijah, who on Mount Carmel (laughs) defeated the 450 false prophets of Baal, not the 850, because the ones of Asherah were not there. They were too chicken and didn't show up. So he defeats those prophets, proves that God's real, yeah, proves that God's real, and then kills them all in judgment. This man ain't soft. So when God was tired of there being silence in the nation, when he was tired of words not being spoken and it was just empty air flowing from men's mouth, that's why there's nothing written down, he decided, I'm not going to send someone soft. I'm not going to send someone sweet. I'm not going to send somebody that's lukewarm. I'm going to send somebody that's tired of the mess that they're in, somebody that's not going to be vomited out of my mouth, somebody that's sick to death of the cotton candy Christianity and there's going to be a voice crying out in the wilderness saying repent the kingdom of heaven is at hand and the the Bible says that all of Jerusalem and all of Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him and confessed their sins and were baptized The wilderness alone where John preached was 600 square miles. Judea and Samaria were 3,400 square miles. Revival. Revival. They got tired of not hearing the truth. And when the truth came, and it was like a shocking glass of water in the face, it was like getting punched in the teeth, they realized, this is what we've been missing, and they all went out in revival and confessed their sins and were baptized. They consecrated themselves towards the Lord. He sent a voice that did not fear man. Before he sent his son. Well, they were only six months apart. Yeah, Jesus didn't show up until after John was already doing his ministry. That's 
Where are we at? What verse are we on? 12. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts. We'll speed up. The feasts are fellowship. It's thought that it would be the Lord's Supper. This would have been, (laughs) y'all gonna love some of this. They shared their problems. They shared their problems. They shared their problems with one another. I know we don't like to do that in church, but we are supposed to confess our sins to one another instead of hiding them. That's how the rebellion started. They shared their problems. They prayed. That's a shocker. They prayed. They worshiped. They ate bread. And they drank wine in memory of Jesus. The false Christians at this time decided to make these gatherings places of grief. And instead of feasting together and in fellowship, they wanted to make these dinners of division. They wanted to pollute the people by their unloving actions and getting involved and just making it a mess. Hidden reefs. What is a reef? A reef is something that you cannot see from the surface. Something dangerous lies beneath the surface. And unfortunately, we often do not realize just how dangerous it is until we're too close. A reef is only dangerous when you're close to it. So these people, they're hidden reefs. They're hidden dangers. You cannot see them until you are too close to them. These are people hidden in plain sight. Verse 12. As they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves. Jude is echoing Ezekiel here. Talking about shepherds that only care about themselves and feeding their egos, feeding their self-righteousness and self-importance. They're never converting anyone. They're not making disciples. They're not leading anyone to Jesus. Instead, they're leading people astray. They're never building them up. They're breaking them down. They're tearing them down with division. They're tearing them down with rumors. They're tearing them down with lies. They're never feeding the sheep. They're gathering the sheep towards them so they can lead them astray to another person who's not a shepherd that's a wolf in sheep's clothing in order to bring them into destruction. Waterless clouds. I love this one. In a dry climate like Israel, you need rain and you need water. To survive, to grow things. What is a waterless cloud? (laughs) These are something that is useless. They never pour anything out. (laughs) All they do is go from place to place, driven by the wind, casting shade. Whoosh. They don't pour anything out. They just cast shade on everything that they think is underneath them. Driven from place to place, pouring nothing out, uh, swept along by the winds, fruitless trees in late autumn. Jude here is showing the gap between promise and performance. A fruitless tree, you are expecting something to be on that tree. Jesus cursed the fig tree when he came up to it because it wasn't bearing fruit. It looked like it was. Another foretelling of, hey, these things that don't bear fruit, but they look like there's something that's supposed to bear fruit, they're a problem. And their, their, mm, their destruction has already been decided beforehand. They're already headed toward judgment. So disconnect yourself from them. Unwind from their roots and get out of their way. Jesus and John the Baptist himself warned against the spiritual barrenness. And in this, these fruitless trees, he's saying these people are empty and they're hollow. Twice dead, uprooted. Twice dead. This is worse 
than someone who has never heard the gospel. These are the people that heard the gospel. They came to church. They might have looked like they had it all going on. They might have looked like they were following Jesus. But then at some point, they decided to turn their back to it and reject it all. So they're twice dead. They are headed towards the second death in Revelation. They were already dead. They may have been brought to life in Jesus. But now they're headed towards the second death, eternal damnation. Well, they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, eternal fire, and we have people that want to tell you these things don't exist. Hell exists. Jesus talked a whole lot about it. A hell of a lot. But people act like it doesn't exist. And as worse as it is that your body, your eternal body, that would be in hell, and I pray none of you end up there. That's why I speak this way. But those bodies that will be in hell will be eternal bodies made for destruction, crying out to die, but never able to die. They will feel pain. They will feel everything against them. And they will never, they will never have their thirst quenched. It will be hard to breathe. Everything will be torment. But the most worst part of the entire thing is God is not there. You cannot call on him to help you. You cannot call on him to lift you out of it. Hell is eternal separation from God. Now, we live in an age and in America where things look bad and gas is really expensive and you got to sell three kids to get a glass of milk. (laughs) And we're praying for everything to turn around and change and revival to come. And we can reach that if God, if we repent and turn back to him He will lift that wrath of judgment from us. But in hell, you don't get that option. You're stuck for a really, 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 really long time. I can't even say enough reallys. Verse 13. Wild waves of the sea. I'll just read it and then we'll walk through it for time. Wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame. You guys can come on. Wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. The wild waves. To the people of this letter, to the people of Israel, this would have been depicting someone lacking self-control. Lacking self-control, wild waves. This is not smooth sailing. Everything is rough. They cause chaos, and they cast up uh, the foam in their own shame. What are they doing? They're leaving behind a uh, 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 polluted, disgusting mess. There's evidence of where they were. There's evidence of the chaos they stirred up. There's evidence of the things they spoke against. There's evidence that they were within your midst. And wandering stars. Obviously, there was no compass back then. There was no radar. So they used stars for navigation. Why? Because they're fixed. They do not move. So a wandering star, and many of these illustrations are figures that promise one thing. They look like they promise one thing and they deliver something else. So you're looking towards the stars for navigation, but a wandering star is something that moves. So they promise you navigation and passage while only bringing you pain and uncertainty. And fear. And the worst part is when you follow a wandering star, the longer you follow it, the further off track you get. They can easily just lead you astray with something simple that's outside of the word. But over time, you're way over here and Jesus is still over here. The wandering star. So Jude has shown us, even though Cain and Korah and Balaam all received almost instant retribution and the false prophets, they're gaining status, they're gaining popularity, they're gaining influence, they're gaining followers. They cannot escape God's judgment. 
Jason, you can, you can hit the lights. And if they don't repent, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved for them forever. God spoke to me this week, and before I read this last verse, I have written down what I feel like he gave me. After speaking with Paul for 20 minutes last week after the last sermon, thank you for your insight. The remnant must be pruned for revival. The remnant must be pruned for revival. The remnant, the remaining factor, we are being diluted in order to be tested and seen if our faith is true. Do we really believe this or do we reject it? Are we going to follow him or are we going to turn away against him? Are we going to be sucked up in the clouds when uh, the rapture happens? Are we going to be left behind where it's going to be absolutely hell and chaos just trying to follow Jesus and trying to find the truth? The restrainer will be removed. Sin will be able to fully come into the world. No holds barred. Sin fully on display. As bad as they persecute Christians in other countries and they chop their head off, it will begin to happen everywhere after the rapture. And with no believers left in the world, the truth will already be increasingly hard to find. It will be for them like starting over. Like Abraham being in a family that didn't know God and worshiped other gods and then God pulling them out and having to baby step them along the way. And hopefully they remain and they endure to the end. And it's gonna be extremely hard for those left behind. But the remnant has to be pruned for revival. Matthew 13. Don't put it on the screen. I know it's back there. Don't put it on the screen. Matthew 13. If you remember, if you were at revival night, there was the parable of the sower. And this entire chapter, Jesus walks through different parables. And at the end of the chapter, in your Bible, there is a heading. In the ESV, it says, Jesus rejected at Nazareth. I only had one verse, but I feel led by the Holy Spirit to read Five verses. This is after all of the parables. And when, verse 53, if you want to write it down to check it later, not on the screens. And when Jesus had finished these parables, God, he went away from there and coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue. So that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? The word carpenter here is actually almost, hmm, it's possibly, I don't want to say it definitively. We all call Jesus the carpenter's son. We said he was a carpenter. It's actually possibly a mistranslation. And a more proper word instead of carpenter would have been something more similar to a stonemason, which makes sense when you see that the stone the builders rejected became the cornerstone. Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother Mary, called Mary, and are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas, Jude? And are not... And are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get 
all these things. These people knew Jesus. He grew up within their midst. His own brothers, his own mother. Astonishing that an angel, a literal angel visited her and she still didn't accept him until after the resurrection. Some people have to see to believe, but blessed are those who believe without seeing. Verse 57, and they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. Verse 58, God help us. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. I don't care. The remnant has to be pruned for revival. When there is a shift within churches and people leave, when truth and revival come to an area and come to a place, some run to it and some run, some run from it. But these people have to go in order for God to move greatly. The remnant must be pruned. God has to cut away the unbelief for the blessing to be unleashed. said people leave when they hear the truth and they were within our midst and they were our friends and we ate dinner with them and we went to movies with them and we had vacations with them and we spoke with them and we, 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 we communed with them and we had parties together and we did life together and now the truth comes and revival comes and Jesus is stirring up his remnant and they run out the door. And the sad part is, as you just saw, not my words, the Bible, God's word. It is because of their unbelief. That is beyond heavy. Jesus could not work there because of their unbelief. And we pray for revival. We ask for revival. We seek revival. And so often we forget that the refining fire has to burn off and cut off that which is trying to kill the body by association because they don't believe and they're just dead inside. White washed tombs. Clean on the outside with dead man's bones inside. God is calling you home. God is calling you home. He's taking us deeper. We 
are descending at his feet. We are making ourselves lower. To take on the form of his servant to just find him. If we can just touch the hem of his garment and be made whole. God is calling you home. There is a reason things have shifted here. There is a reason things have shifted in America in some churches, not all. The remnant, a small amount. And God is stirring up his saints, reigniting the fire, and seeing who is going to withstand this crucible and stand for Christ And go forth and make disciples to help wake up the world, to help God reconcile the world to himself. And if you are living in sin today, everybody stand on their feet, please. If you are living in sin today, I urge you to come forth. Come now. Don't wait. Don't tarry. Notice I didn't say if you don't believe in God. I said if you are living in sin. Pretty much everyone in the room has something to repent of. Starting with one, fear of man. Why? The pastor calls you to come forth to the altar to make a public confession of your faith, to repent of your sin, but you're too scared of being judged by those who see you walk down the aisle. Thank you. That is honorable. Come up here, actually. No, well, never mind. I want to stand with you. But I realize that's probably putting you more on display. Come. If you feel the pull of the Holy Spirit, come. We all have sin in our life. We all have something we are dealing with. We all have something God wants to cut out of our life. And he has never called you to hide it in a box. He has never called you to white knuckle grip the back of a seat and ignore the the call and the tug of the Holy Spirit as he convicts you. We all have something to deal with. I have sin to deal with. So I urge you, I challenge you, I challenge you in the name of Jesus to come forth, to lay it on this altar. That's strength. And in a minute, don't do it yet. Ah, what a perfect song. Set a fire. God is pruning this church. He's pruning his body for what is coming. And while I don't want people to leave, the reality is some people have to leave because of their unbelief. And I don't want that. I want you to stay here and listen as long as possible because the seed of the Holy Spirit will be planted within you. And I pray that God pulls at you even right now and tugs at you and says, you need to go down there. Don't wait another minute because you could walk out of these doors and be killed immediately. And it would be doing you a disservice by not bringing that up. I feel that. Man, I don't, I don't know who it is, but somebody in here, God is, shoot. This moment, I don't care how crazy you think I look. I don't care if you think this is a bunch of crap. This moment right here, God is giving you, somebody in this room, your final call. Today, oh man.
today might not be your last day, but God is saying it's now or never. I have had this. I fought this for months, but I refused to tell God no. That doesn't ever work. It doesn't work with your calling and newsflash. It's not going to work with eternity. I'm going to pray. And when I see amen, Jessica, you can fire that song and let's go. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't care. Don't care. Don't care what anyone thinks. I don't care if it's going to be an awkward car ride home. I don't care if they want to mock you on the way home. God will not be mocked. And if you come down and you confess your sins, you will be saved and he will honor that decision instead of hiding. Heavenly Father, God, we feel you in this place. We know you are here. We know you are here. We thank you for being here for the ability to be here. God, I thank you for sending these people to the altar, for pulling on their hearts. I pray in the name of Jesus that you release fire into their lives. Ignite the flames, the tongues of fire, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. God, consecrate all of us now, especially those willing and having the fortitude to not fear man and come and confess their faith in you. Laying their tears on the altar. There is not a moment wasted at the altar. There is nothing wasted. There is no moment wasted. And for somebody, God wants you to know that your darkness is there for his light to shine the brightest. So, Father, I ask you, stir these people up. Forgive us of our sins. Create in us a deeper level of consciousness for your consecration, for your word, for your scriptures, a reverence for your word, a reverence for your scriptures. God, reconcile these people to you. Take us deeper. Take them deeper. And God, set that fire down in their soul. Renew us, Lord. And in the mighty and in the majestic and in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. Hey, I hope that message spoke to you today. I want to say thank you to everybody who is involved at Family Church and those who help support this ministry. If you would like to get more involved, you can click the link in the description or head to our website, familychurch.social. We would love to connect with you, and you can find all of our social media platforms on our website. Also, if this message spoke to you in any way today and you liked it, consider sharing it on your social media in any way that you would like so that we can help reach those far from God and return them to the arms of the Father. We want to see God work through you. We love you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.